All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 28th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I want to talk primarily to my independent fundamentalist Baptist brethren. Uh, brothers and sisters, it's time to grow up. We don't have time to play these foolish games anymore. First, a little personal testimony. Okay, we've lived in this area of uh, Danville, this is the second time we've lived around here, for uh, 10 some years now, 13 years, I guess. And during that time, I've been looking for a church, and I've been unable to find anything within 15 miles, probably more than that. I would have been willing to go up to 30 miles. Anything acceptable for a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. I've tried. I've looked in some odd places. I even spent a year at a very close, uh, small Nazarene church that hadn't given themselves over to the culture like the denomination or the regional headquarters is pushing. All the other ones have gone to the big screen, latest Christian CCM music and tore out the pews and put stacked chairs in and all these superficial things, including blacking out the churches and making them look like nightclubs, led by uh, young women in ragged, holy jeans and men, young men that are just out to promote themselves and make a career for themselves. Uh, building up one church rapidly and destroying it, and then moving on to another, which is the story of one around here. Put it, changing the name, doing a church makeover, you know, because it's all about external things. Attract the world. It's the Nazarene version of Seeker Sensitive. They've gone fully over to the Rick Warren model uh, because they have no gospel. They have no power. The holiness movement is bankrupt. Wesley was spiritually bankrupt. See, you can, you, can, you can fake it for a while, but all you do is produce hypocrites. And now that I've just seen that the National Association of Evangelicals has committed an act of apostasy, I mean, they've been going this direction, along with the Southern Baptists and others, for a long time. Southern Baptists, they're, they're a ship with several torpedo holes in them, and it's a question of, do they sink? Right now, they're in a battle to keep the ship afloat. Whether it's a losing battle or not, probably. I think the denomination is so worldly that it cannot resist the culture. It drags its feet, and it may be kicking and screaming, but it's being dragged along by the world. I've never been in a Southern Baptist church that was not worldly. Oh, there was many believers there. But their level of commitment to Christ seemed to be secondary to their commitment to the world or to the denomination, which is of the world. But the NAE, in their in-your-face promotion of wokeism, trying to convert evangelical or new evangelical churches to wokeism, that is entirely of the world. To uh, Apostasy is not simply losing your faith 
or simply denying Jesus and not believing anymore. It is going over to the other side. It's spiritual treason. It's switching sides. It's going from one side to the other. The, the word is used of Paul in the New Testament. The Pharisees regarded him as being an apostate because he left them to go to the Christians. He switched sides. It's treason. So the NAE has committed treason against Christ by leaving their f fidelity to him. The so-called bride of Christ getting in bed with the world and pursuing the things that please the world. Now, Billy Graham and company set uh, the, the new evangelical movement that they started on this trajectory a long time ago, and it's come to the end of the road. It's come to the point of spiritual destruction. To go with the NAE is to die. It is on the broad way and has reached the end of the road. But I've, 13 years in this area, and I've looking, looked for a church that was acceptable. Now, I can be pretty picky. Because I am a born-again Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. I take the Bible very seriously. And I take understanding the Bible very seriously. I believe it is the Word of God. And I know the one who saved me. Some, how many years ago now? 46? I have to, it's long enough I have to get the calculator out. Now, it's 47 years ago. 1976. After I had been a Lutheran for 21 years. A typical wishy-washy, believe in God, but it's not the center of your life, Christian. Which is not a Christian at all. If you're not born again. You're not in the kingdom of God. But I was born again at Minot Air Force Base in my dorm room when the Holy Spirit came in there after a period of conviction of sin, the Holy Spirit convicting me of sin, and then the Holy Spirit revealing to me that Christ had died for my sins. And because of what he did, I was right with God. I was born again. I didn't have the language to describe it then, because this was something that Lutherans did not talk about. Although there are born-again Lutherans, few that they may be. I didn't know any of anything, such thing. But God had a plan, and apparently I was a target of that plan. And not that I was worthy of it, certainly. Uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen independent fundamental Baptists. It appears to me that we are the last bulwark. There are other sort of fundamentalist churches like the, the OPC, the, uh, what does that stand for? Uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, I believe, that are, you could call them fundamentalist Presbyterians. There, there's some very conservative uh, denominations around. The Missouri Baptists are pretty, or Missouri Baptists, Missouri, Missouri Lutherans, and uh, the Wisconsin Senate are, uh, are pretty conservative. You could almost call them, they act like fundamentalists sometimes, uh, in some of the bad ways. Um, but yeah, uh, highbrow fundamentalists, you could call them, I don't know. Uh, a little different. But uh, as, as far as being Christ-centered, again, there are some good churches there, but they have some handicaps. What are, where's the last bastion of biblical New Testament Christianity? It's the only the independent fundamental Baptists are the only ones left. The only ones left in the United States or anywhere else that I'm aware of. 
Do, do you know that the Pentecostals and the uh, uh, Charismatics together by far outnumber evangelicals, which in, in their categories would include fundamentalists, far, by at least a factor of two, worldwide. And we know where the vast majority of evangelicals are going, and, the, and charismatics, by definition, are not Bible believers. The Bible is not their sole authority. And that's the same thing about Pentecostals. The Bible is not, and the New Testament is not their sole authority for faith and practice. They don't believe in sola scriptura. They look to other sources, uh, visions, dreams, inspired prophets, words from God. They don't believe in the faith delivered once for all unto the church. They believe in whatever wind, whatever spirit happens to be blowing through their empty heads. Been with them long enough. Tried to work with them long enough. Spoke in tongues long enough. It's not a language. I always wondered, what is this? And I've had, had enough experience to know this is not a language. It doesn't have the necessary vocabulary and the form to be a language. Okay, so those are utterly unreliable. They, 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 we've seen the direction they've gone. The charismatic movement started out as like a renewal movement in dead churches, including Rome. But because they're not grounded in Scripture, that is not their anchor, that is not their standard, they've gone all over the place, all different directions. You can find all kinds of bizarre things. You know, it's interesting. Who is mocked on YouTube? It's the Independent Fundamental Baptists. They love to mock them, us. Why? Why? They don't mock the Charismatics. They don't mock the Pentecostals. They don't mock the United Methodists. They don't mock the living dead. I may be out of bounds, out of line, but from my perspective, the independent fundamental Baptist churches are the only bastion left for the gospel in the United States and probably around the world. In Africa, for example, the bastion against the, the, uh, the prosperity gospel, the, the faithful independent fundamental Baptist churches that are ministering on the Mexican border and in Mexico, started by faithful men of God who have given their life to Jesus Christ, who live, who could live much better in the United States doing whatever they wanted. I'm not talking about all of the FIBs, but F IFBs, but are some. As I say too often, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I just saw the ugly yesterday. I saw that local church, the largest IFB in this area, which interestingly, every time I visited there, I, my, my desire was to leave the building as fast as I could. And I couldn't tell you why. I, wouldn't know, I didn't know why. There was something just was just irritated me about the place. I've had that happen before, and it usually had to do with something that was seriously wrong. But I didn't know at the time until later when the news came out, and, and this is another case. Just last month, I just became aware of it yesterday, uh, there was a trial in Danville, Illinois here, and uh, apparently uh, a the man who had been principal at that school for, number, for like about four years and teacher was indicted in 2021 
for felony uh, sexual abu- uh, sexual a- assault. And he plea bargained down to one count and was convicted at the end of August uh, as on that count and was sentenced to 12 years in prison, which is not the biblical penalty for that. If he actually did what he probably did, I don't know the details. I just became aware of it yesterday. Uh, but I do know from what I was able to quickly gather, it went on for a period of four years. And the young man didn't reveal it until he left the area and went to college. And the man who did it had left in 2016 and became the uh, a teacher at Maranatha Bible uh, University, or Mar- what they, Maranatha Baptist University, call themselves now, Watertown, Wisconsin. Uh, which I am somewhat familiar with. I visited there one time, thinking about possibly going there. I quickly gave up that idea. (laughs) This place is full of children. I I was not 18 years old at the time, let's put it that way. Uh, I had been in the military and been out, and I've been spent a couple years in secular University of Wisconsin. But I went there and but no, I, I would not get along here. I would be arguing with the professors constantly because I do trust in the word of God and I will not accept a man's word when he disagrees with scripture. I don't care who he is, um, if the pastor or whatever. When it's plainly contrary to what the scripture teaches, I reject it and every good Christian should too. We are to judge those in the church, including the pastor's sermon. Because somebody, if we don't hold them to account, if we don't demand fidelity to the scriptures and careful preaching. Now, I've made plenty of errors preaching. When I do these videos, I often intend to say one thing and the wrong word comes out and I don't notice it unless I review the video and say, that's not what I intended to say. Sometimes I just leave it in because I'm a vessel of clay. And it's not my perfection, but Christ's perfection you should be looking to. My flaws demonstrate what I am. Flawed. Because my I still live in this unredeemed body. But who's left? The only church I could find acceptable was one that... I wasn't terribly fond of because when I visited it, it was Sunday nights and the pastor was going through the Old Testament and I'd rather not hear that because often pastors, preachers engage in, uh, what's the word? Um, Well, they interpret the Old Testament in such a way as to create a message that they want to give because we're not under the law. We're not under that. And even some of the best preachers sometimes get confused about the difference between the law and the gospel. That's one thing the Lutherans generally did not do. Uh, but there's some other serious issues there. But so we began, finally began attending there. Our des- desperation, we even went to a Nazarene church for a year until it became obvious that the gospel was not important there was not. They did not preach Christ and Christ crucified. At that point, it was, and confronting the pastor over that, uh, they did not believe, they allowed you to believe in imputed righteousness, which is the gospel, that we have the righteousness of Christ given to us as a free gift. That is gospel. They would allow you to believe that, but it wasn't really their doctrine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If one th- there's, there's one thing that's intolerable, absolutely intolerable, it is a false gospel. Absolutely intolerable to Paul was a false gospel. So I ended up in desperation trying to say, well, maybe I can possibly endure 
Unfortunately, on Sunday mornings, it's better. It tends to be much more New Testament, gospel-centered. I was... I don't know if he, I hope he stays in the New Testament. Maybe he just does the Old Testament in the evening. Then I'll just not go then. But I'm not going to go to a to a church and listen to somebody go verse by verse through the Proverbs for two years. No, I'm a Christian. I follow Christ. I don't look to the Proverbs for Christ when we have the New Testaments in the words of Jesus himself and the words of his apostles. Why would we look to, to shadows and types when we have the actual promised one with us? When we have the gospel, when Christ has come, when he has died for our sins and risen from, risen from the dead. See, the, the Proverbs don't save anyone. The law saves no one. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can save. Only in it is the power of God unto salvation revealed. Now, I've heard a local, as I mentioned, a local Lutheran pastor that consistently preaches the gospel. But there are some other things, too, that is utterly inconsistent with the Scripture. I'm just too biblical to put up with it. Maybe I'm too biblical for independent fundamentalist Baptists. I don't know. That's where they need to correct some things. But that is the last bastion of Christianity in the United States, as far as I can tell. You don't find it anywhere else. And now the, the evangelical, the neo-evangelical movement has gone to the end of the line. It's finished. It's dead. And it was apparent to me and probably to some others back in 19, uh, 2015 when the Supreme Court ruling came down uh, that Christians, many, many denominations were going to go apostate because they love the world. That's the way Southern Baptists are headed. Because they love the world, the pull is in that direction. A worldly denomination will not stand against the flood because it loves the world, wants to go with it. And as long as the world is fairly close, they can pull off this stunt. But when the world is going one way and it's opposed to Christ, openly, openly anti-Christ world, as we have today, you cannot love the world and walk with Christ. Never was really possible, but see, if you love the world, you will go with the flow. You will adjust your faith. And eventually, you'll simply deny the faith because you're no longer able to keep the two together. You'll have to choose one or the other. No man can serve two masters. You will hate the one and love to the other or cling to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or Christ and the world. Now, independent fundamental Baptists have always understood that. The problem was and is is when they become distracted and they want to be militant and fight the world rather than proclaim Christ and him crucified. That's the problem. Because the devil loves to distract us into secondary issues. And boy, has there been a lot of secondary and tertiary issues that have, have distracted independent fundamentalist Baptists. I talk from personal experience. And I've been connected with independent fundamental Baptists from, from Wisconsin to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and visited 
every church within 20 miles of here. In fact, every church that could be remotely considered Bible-believing within 20 miles of where I am. Every fundamentalist Baptist church, for sure. And I've seen things that have disturbed me because they're not biblical. And things now that have scandalized me were with this largest church sexual scandal. More than a sexual scandal. A criminal sexual assault, which is basically a rape of a uh, technically a minor, or what I would say is a young man, 14-year-old man. I don't consider 14-year-olds as children. They're not children. They're not mature men, but they're not children. And certainly in the Bible, they are not children. And the Bible is where we get our guidance from, is it not? Not the culture. The culture is damned. It's going to destruction. But we are the only, we are the ark, the only Noah's ark. We are Noah's ark. We are the only thing left that's proclaiming the gospel, as, as a, a group at least. You know, they're, they're scattered, other things out there, but not consistent. But the problem is that Satan loves to distract people. Bible-believing, born-again Christians loves to distract us. That's what he can do. He's a liar. He can get us to focus on something else. Uh, case in point, Jerry Falwell, who was once upon a time a fundamentalist, although his church was, you know, it, to be acceptable on television, to have a big audience, you can't really be a fundamentalist. Not truly. You have to compromise. You have to do what pleases people. And then eventually, of course, he... Uh, he ended up joining the Southern Baptists. And then we, then we probably know what happened with his son and his son's wife, Jerry Falwell Jr. Talk about a sex scandal in a Christian school. See, Satan loves that kind of stuff because he says, see, that's what kind of people these are. They're all hypocrites. No, we're not. No, we're not. But Satan loves the big lie, and he loves the publicity. He is, the world is of him. But who's holding the fort? Who's holding the line? Fundamentalist Baptists are the only ones left. It's the reason why we're mocked by everyone. Now, some will say you're not even a fundamentalist Baptist because you're not a member of the church. Yes, I am a member of Christ Church. That's another problem with a, a, a false ecclesiology or an insufficient ecclesiology. The church of Jesus Christ is all those that belong to him. You can have your local church idea, but it's not correct. The local church is only the born-again believers in a locality. Whether they're in your building or not, if you think you're exclusively the local church because you have a name in front of the building, you are as deceived as the non-instrumental churches of Christ. Or the instrumental churches of Christ, for that matter. We are the church of Christ. Nobody else is. Sounds like Rome. That's nonsense. Unbiblical nonsense. That's one of the problems. Fundamental Baptists have to be biblical. Or we're no use to God. We, we are the ones that have to be biblical. The Pentecostals don't. The Charismatics don't. The Methodists don't. The Presbyterians are all concerned, and the Reformed Baptists are more concerned with their, with their creeds 
than the scripture. They put more hope in their creed than the scripture. Who stands for scripture alone? We do. Consistently, we do. But we have to practice that consistently. Which means you can't do what you want to do. Like Jerry Falwell. What's right in our own eyes and go create a, a culture war movement, the moral majority, which accomplished what? Nothing. Nothing. It wasn't about Christ and him crucified. Jerry Falwell took Jesus Christ out of the picture in order to appeal to more people for his movement. He compromised the gospel. He compromised the purpose of Christ's church in order to pursue what was right in his own eyes. And it bore no good fruit. And he's just an example. When preachers, and I'm going to use the older examples that you don't hear quite so much anymore, but you may. Things like wire rim glasses that marked you as an unbeliever. Hair that touched the top of your ear that made you an unbeliever. In other words, you had to have a crew cut, a military crew cut. Based on what? In the scripture? If you can't prove something that the scripture actually teaches this in the New Testament, you're not supposed to be preaching it. Women wearing pants. Well, why not preach against men not wearing robes? Who gives men the right to wear pants? See, mistaking unimportant things in the culture or engaging in uh, cultural issues It's just like the battle between the fundamentalists uh, about abortion. Or, no, it's not abortion, um, uh, evolution. We should have just said, you are of the world. So you believe that there's no God because you are of the world. You deliberately suppress the knowledge of the truth. And you must repent and believe in Christ. And that should be all we are willing to say to them. Not trying to argue against their lies because they just invent them faster than you could fight against them anyway. Because that does not bring people to salvation. Mistaking the purpose, the, the apostles did not argue against the, the, the uh, argue about the civil religion of Rome. They proclaimed Christ and trusted God to call those who he chooses to call. And if our churches are not what God wants them to be, then he can't send people that he wants to save to our churches. They don't need to come and hear lectures uh, about how bad the world is or about foolish issues that are irrelevant to the gospel. They need to come and hear about Christ and him crucified. We need to focus on the fundamentals of Christ. Every fundamental of the fundamental movement was about Christ. When you make separation the primary issue, you have left Christ. When you make dress the, the primary issue, you have departed from Jesus Christ. When you make politics the issue, you have betrayed Jesus Christ. And evangelicals have done much of this, but fundamental independent Baptists have often done the same thing. Preached about women wearing slacks. And not that long ago, brothers and sisters, and in Mexico, I was subjected to that at a, a, a conference under a tin roof with no walls. We don't need fancy buildings. We don't need that. We, we can do like they do in Mexico. Be a little uncomfortable in the winter, but it was uncomfortable in the summer too, believe me. No walls do give you a slight breeze though. 
and the roof would have leaked. It was basically a hay shelter. You know, it was a roof, no walls. Rough sawn planks on top of concrete blocks for pews. Sit on those for four or five hours sometimes. We can do it. Do we love Christ? Do we belong to him? Are we filled with his spirit? So that he leads us, the spirit of truth leads us into all truth. And he keeps us focused on Christ. Can't do it in the flesh. And he keeps the church pure. Because it's his church. The spirit of Christ's church. Where else is the gospel preached? Joel Osteen's church? Rick Warren type churches? Churches of Christ with no gospel at all? Five works you must do to be saved? Baptismal regeneration? No, they don't really believe in regeneration. Excuse me. Just five things you must do to be saved. The five steps to heaven. The Methodists? Even the conservative Methodists? I visited a local church for a couple of weeks. The sermons were about video games and sports figures and evangelical Methodist or something like that. Where's Christ and him crucified? No. Again, the Nazarenes. A year. No Christ crucified. Once in a while I fell down and I remember preaching about Christ and the new covenant and the people were looking at me odd. Like, what's he talking about? Now, I preach some really bad sermons too. I, I confess that. But when you're preaching what is the gospel, and people look at you strange in a church? Have they never heard it before? Perhaps. Perhaps, which is why I don't go there anymore. No. So that, you know, those churches are all, and that church was, that denomination is also going woke with the world. The holiness, the Nazarenes, the largest holiness denomination, is going with the world. Very obviously around here. Very obviously. They're going with the Rick Warren methodology. Become like the world in order to please the world, in order to save the world. The neo-evangelical theology. Conform to the world in order to win them. Well, what happens? You become the world, as is so evident with the NAE today, the National Association of Evangelicals, and their program, in-your-face program, to wokeify your church. They're all concerned about racial re, uh, what restitution and reconciliation. These are non-issues in the Church of Jesus Christ. Because God has given us a love for the brethren. I've never met racists among independent fundamental Baptists. Never. I'm sure there's some there. But where I was, like on the Mexican border, wasn't an issue. I never heard statements. I've heard statements from others. But never heard any statements like that. Because they're brothers, brothers in Christ are brothers in Christ. We have to put away the foolishness. We can't afford it anymore. We can't afford culture wars. The culture is lost. What are you trying to save? It's always been lost. What are you trying to save? Like Jerry Wolf Falwell. Going out to, to solve the problem of pornography. Where are we today? 
way beyond that. So, the world is lost. No amount of culture war can save a single soul. Because salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We must be more fundamental. Because, like I said, every one of the fundamentals focused on Christ. Everything else is a distraction, a diversion. That he must remain central. Always. Christ and him crucified must be our central and really our only theme. Because only in Christ's salvation is there the power and the will to do what is right. That in Christ he has made unto us wisdom and sanctification. He is our justification. He is the one who is at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Christianity is Christ. And Christ is Christianity. What else can it be? He is our life. He is our eternal life, our righteousness, our hope, our faith, our joy, our strength. He is all the fruit of the Spirit, and he works those in us. We can't do it with programs. We can't do it with principles, a.k.a. law. We must live by faith as we're taught in the New Testament. When we do that, we will truly be the temple of God. And it will be safe for God to send sinners to us to hear the gospel. But as it is, have we grown tired of the gospel? If so, we need to repent, to turn back to the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, to the center of that faith, which is Christ. All these other side issues are unimportant compared to him. Will we be the last refuge? Will we be the ark of salvation? Or will we abandon the lost world to the apostates that have left Christ? That's what the devil wants. He's been winning. Will he win us too? Or will we stand firm and hold to Christ? Christ, will we stand fast in the truth of the gospel?